data that exists within all our smartphones today have reached such a critical mass that we're seeing them actually land directly natively within devices. So you'll see Chromebooks, you'll see laptops, you'll see all different devices that actually will have these connectivity chips and integrate it directly into the device, not as a secondary device. That's step one, because you don't necessarily buy a cell phone then buy a means to gain access to the internet with that cell phone. So solving that problem to disconnect that disparate experience, now you extend that experience onto the connectivity. And I think solving for that connectivity creates the means for the content to be accessed. And, and there's a couple things I think we look at at Microsoft from a really high level is given our mass and our scale with what we're trying to do with connectivities, we have unique relationships with the connectivity providers. So what we're seeking to do is to find ways for the device itself to have the chip that connect, be connectivity enabled and then allowing that connectivity enabled to connect to a provider in the local areas for where the access to the content is actually needed. So technology's role in smoothing these experiences, but then also making sure that those experiences are like other experiences where we've seen analogies for broad adoption is key. We have to disrupt that. On the other side of that, it's addressing the economics for access and equality. And this is a very interesting analogy too, when you think about the impedance that exists for access. And to be really frank, it, it comes down to finding the right cost tied to the right margins and putting that in the right situations for folks to be able to gain access for that. That's something that's not only based on equity, but based on equality. That's gonna be critical. And an example we can see that we're looking at is around the way we do pay per use solutions today. And the, I can give you an example of that with Netflix. You gain access to content on Netflix on a monthly basis tied to that service. That's wrapped into what's called a use license. And that use license lets you binge, like we all binge on Netflix as often as we can tied to that monthly access fee. The paradigm exists for taking hardware, marrying it with software and other enablement solutions tied to software as a service. So you essentially acquire access to a service, but you don't buy the hardware, the connectivity that's tied for you to consume it. We can do the same thing with devices. If you take LTE chips, land them within those devices, and then you find a way to subsidize that actual device with the connectivity and bridge those two, it can create a really unique and disruptive solution where you can actually hand a device to a student or to an educator and he or she doesn't necessarily have to worry about any other devices. They turn it on and they light up that experience. So we're seeing price points and laptops come within the $100 range. Um, we're also finding ways to find margins within that to make sure that we can take the subsidies tied to acquiring that device and letting the use of that device be tied to an access um, license for Microsoft technology. I think as we integrate those two, you'll find a way for us to be able to close the gap because instead of there being a significant barrier to an end user gaining access to connectivity, compute, and content, you'd actually see all those three integrated into a single license. And that license use can be subsidized in a variety of different ways. Those are some of the ways we're looking at trying to solve that, disrupting the disconnected experience, and also make sure we can address the economics of it so we have better equality for access. Thanks, Ali. Super intriguing. Um, I appreciate the the fact that you know we in the education space have been working on device for so long and had had before COVID barely begun to um, figure out how we get Wi-Fi at home. I know that's something that Dylan had been doing uh, with CETF. Um, so it's intriguing to see how we can take care of those two challenges um, with one opportunity and, and, and can't wait to hear what the timeline yeah. is for that. Um, Dylan, I'd love for you um, to talk about how that resonates in, in, um, with the realities that you're seeing today in terms of how distance learning is going for you and your schools. And, and Christy, maybe you can follow up. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky enough to work with a, with a couple of different districts during the pandemic and really kind of get a glimpse as to basically what are the needs of these schools? What, are, what, what do these schools all have in common uh, at these district levels? And one of those, the biggest things that, that I've noticed that COVID has laid bare is that number one, that affordable broadband is crucial for, uh, for, for performing distance learning. That's number one. And so 
we're consistently looking for ways in which we can provide affordable broadband to our students. But kind of the silver lining, I think, of COVID-19 in a lot of ways, I know there's very few silver linings to a massive global pandemic, but the idea that we were fighting for was that we needed to get our students to have one-to-ones. We needed to get our students to have a device. We needed to make sure that our students had access to a device, especially our, our black and brown students in the inner city who may not have that at home. How can we get a device in their hands and allow them to take that device home and take it back to school, uh, et cetera? Uh, COVID has forced schools' hands in a lot of ways. So I think that we've really worked towards uh, a lot of our students being one-to-one. -one. Um, and that goes outside of just what we've done at LA Promise. Well, when I was there, we were one-to-one -one from the beginning at LA Promise Charter Middle School. But this is for the, the entire district where you're adding where people have devices now, students have devices. So I think that's a big deal. I think that's a, a massive thing that we, we that you know we were trying to do, that we we're pushing for, and now we have that based upon uh, the effects of COVID-19. At the same time, with the Wi-Fi infrastructure, trying to make sure that our students have Wi-Fi, this problem was there it existed before COVID-19. Our, our you know our students, our low-income students, didn't have access to the internet, and so by COVID affecting so many people, now we are looking at oh. What can we do to make sure our students have this, this access to affordable broadband? So in a lot of ways, you know, the silver lining is it, it's laid a lot of these problems bare and schools and districts have had to address it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's, 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 I think that's the, the biggest, the biggest positive uh, from this on education. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, and to extend um, on Dylan's comments um, on providing one-on-one -on -one devices, um, School to Home has allowed our students to jump over one major hurdle. Do they have a device to connect um, with their peers, let alone their teachers, and potentially for their parents as well? Um, so thank you, Mr. Powell, for kind of discussing and shedding light on the future of connectivity and making sure that it one day will be um, more equitable to different communities because about six students per week um, will send an email, ironically, when the connection's available or a text just stating that they weren't able to jump on. So that's going to be very critical because although School to Home has done a good job placing a device into every child's hands, um, that connectivity um, is an issue as well. Um, overall, for just understanding how things are going um, with distance learning, that's going to vary between educators and students overall. Um, we're looking at attendance, for example, um, to understand the health and participation of a child that we don't see in person. And we're seeing that um, if we can connect with the student, we can better understand where they're there versus they have a learning need um, at the educator level. And so our biggest challenges um, when we're in the classroom, if you can imagine a physical classroom the last time you remember it, and now having to be forced, just like um, Mr. Porter just said, into distance learning, all our challenges from building relationships with students if we didn't have enough time in the beginning of the school year to helping them troubleshoot any technology issues or to simply progress in their reading and writing um, have now amplified. So those challenges have grown um, over distance learning and a lot of educators are really pushing to help students um, in as many ways possible. Um, but of course the school year does end soon. Christy, um, if you were to say, if you were to kind of rate yourself and your ability um, to, to be your normal teacher self, you know, what percentage would you say that you were able to be the usual teacher, um, both delivering content and um, being connected to your kids? Um, if I wanted to be kind to myself, potentially 50%. And to explain, it's because I'm a science and STEM teacher. Um, our world and curriculum is both physical and digital. So all the support we get and all the interest we try to bring into the classroom um, for the students. Um, I'm unable to provide a kinesthetic, um, a collaborative environment um, for the students because um, the roadblock, and that could have been me in the beginning of the school year, not um, with enough urgency, pushing students into routines, but I can promise that we were making progress along the way. Um, but with technology, although technology is a tool and we're grateful to have it, um, for that quality 
aspect of learning, um, it can't necessarily be there. There's still missing elements that maybe technology could try to fix, but it won't be 100%. Great, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate you being um, so honest with us on, on a, a subject that I know um, is so sacred to teachers' um, own self um, evaluation because you always try to bring your best self every day um, to the classroom. Um, it's also, you know, so telling because as we start to see, you guys, this is the end of the year as we talked about, and so we're gonna, it, beginning probably next week and for the month and the summer and the years ahead, we're gonna start seeing some analysis of data and trends to establish some trends and how distant learning, distance learning went, um, um, I think within single schools, within districts, within the state and beyond. Um, and looking at that from different subgroup levels as well. And I've seen two, two studies so far that suggest that about 40 to 60% of parents have expressed hesitancy in, in the possibility of sending their children back to the schoolhouse, the physical schoolhouse this August because of con continued concerns about health and safety related to COVID. And so what that means is that, and the states also, and the counties also issued some guidelines that says that, you know, you can continue to do distance learning. You can have um, these kids back in school with a whole bunch of procedures for health and safety, um, or you can do a hybrid model. But what it will mean in many scenarios is that distance learning will still be a reality for us as we um, um, uh, start school in August. And so I'm just wondering, um, maybe Ali, you can start us off. What are some best options that we think we need to continue to evolve and, and provide teachers so that they can be their best um, professional selves in the classroom? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great question, Veronica, because if I think about what Christy just said, what was interesting about it was technology doesn't solve the problem. Technology is included in the application of the solution that needs to be delivered by the teacher to the student. And, and we see that in a bi-directional way. And I will say this, the same concerns that parents express for their kids returning to school is analogous to the workforce returning back to offices. And so we, what we've looked at from a Microsoft perspective is whether you're looking at corporations or you're looking at educational institutions, kind of two things really still ring true is that securely kind of enabling the remote workforce is no different in a way from a technological perspective than trying to enable remote learning. Um, both of which still require at the ends of where that technology exists for a person to apply it and to leverage it. So the nice thing about kind of where technology is headed is the solutions um, enable actually support both segments, the corporations as well as the educational institutions. So there's three areas um, that Microsoft is looking at, and I'm going to generalize it to say that the industry is looking at in terms of how we approach this. I think the first one is, look, the reality of extending the reach of the classroom will be here for some time. And, and so now it's really about there's this first onboard of the extension of the classroom, needing the infrastructure, needing the solutions like Teams, like Zoom, like others, to make sure that that can be extended and there's an opportunity to engage. I think the next phase of that is you'll see more and more integrations. Um, Microsoft, Microsoft, we just announced some integrations with Teams, with Canvas, with Blackboard, with Schoolology, with Brightspace. Those integrations now will put teachers in a situation where they can actually start to get the best breed of solutions and still leverage the technology to deliver the reach of the classroom. I think the most important thing there is we need to minimize the impedance between where best of breed is to delivering the best possible educational experience um, to the students in the classroom that can be offered and delivered by the school and the teachers and the administration. I think the next piece is leveraging technology to enable equality. And, and I'm on this equality point because when you think about um, having the opportunity to leverage accessibility functions within these solutions, um, now you can start to see students who might have dyslexia be able to leverage some of the native tooling within Word, um, Microsoft Word, to let them take advantage to learn at the same rate or read at the same rate, or more importantly, communicate at the same rate as other students. Again, technology should be there to magically 
create an opportunity for all those to be able to learn. On the other side, when you look at artificial intelligence, our ability now to enable teachers of large class sizes to create cohorts within those rooms, within the technology of Teams, and then use artificial technologies to get signals or notifications. But we understand when you're looking at a screen and it might have 27 to 35 kids in the classroom, that's a lot of signals for a single person to process. Well, with artificial technology, think about the situations now with facial recognition for those that have an iPhone, clearly you use Face ID to log in. Leveraging similar technology from an AI perspective, now a teacher can get signals to be able to pay attention to whose eyes are drifting for a long period of time. Based on facial expressions, who's showing signs of uninterest. Um, just signals to let the teacher be able to have the same tacit awareness they would classically have in a classroom bringing that through to enable them to take advantage of that from an AI perspective. I think on the last piece just around is around enabling equality. Equality. That's thinking about, look, we need to make sure we ready and enable teachers who are transitioning into this remote learning phase. And so Microsoft has this Microsoft for Educators solution that really takes a customer or a teacher through the spectrum of kind of what that's like. And there's tooling and there's different fact-based solutions that we have there from the learnings we're gathering, not only from ourselves, but some of our larger partners in the technology space. And in one more application, I think our student ambassadors, this one's really important because what we found when you move on to the internet and we pay attention to just how social media has been so successful, when you democratize the access to the tooling and you require micro communities to be created, we notice that in the social space, in the consumer space. Now we're applying that within the educational space. So now these learned student ambassadors can leverage the same tools to create robust tech communities and develop technical and career opportunities built on platforms that integrate not only just with Microsoft, but across the ecosystem. So now from that perspective, you can think about us having the opportunity to lower to an extent the bar it actually took for most of these students and educators to gain access to this technology without requiring IT or some other hands to support them to solve for that. And I think these three things together can help our um, teachers, can actually help our parents have more confidence in the fact that we can start to rub some of the lines between a teacher being fully enabled to deliver those solutions and providing a means for us to still respect what we're trying to do as we transition back to normal, which won't be a switch, it'll likely be a DAO as we move forward. Yeah. Wow, you guys are staying busy over there at Microsoft. We appreciate you thinking about the needs of our students and our teachers. Um, and I, I'd love, Christy or Dylan, any responses or thoughts? Um, I, I might pose it another way, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause first and see if you guys well, got some. Just, just, to, just to kind of go back to the whole idea of like parents not feeling comfortable sending students back to school. We also need to revisit the idea of teachers not feeling comfortable coming back to school. Um, I think that's kind of an overlooked idea of like teachers coming back and what, how, how, what are their comfortability, you know, coming back during this pandemic and especially pe teachers where we might have pre-existing health conditions, things of that nature. How are we making sure that whatever we're doing is making those teachers feel comfortable being in the classroom again, right, and giving instruction? So I think as we go forward, as we move forward with um, kind of dealing with this, like Ali is saying, like this is going to be a, a process. It's not going to just happen overnight. It's not a light switch. I think it's just going to be interesting to see what kind of precautions can we put out there, number one, that protect our students, but also what kind of precautions are we putting out there for teachers? Secondarily, I think that we need to start looking at what are, what are our teams at our schools? Do we have distance learning teams? What happens when somebody gets, when you have someone who gets sick from COVID-19 in, in a student cohort, and that student cohort is forced to, you know, be quarantined for a couple of weeks? What do we do to make sure that uh, those students are getting the best uh, curriculum they can possibly get who are, who are stuck in that quarantine for those, those two weeks, regardless of the hybrid model? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these are just kind of bigger questions we have to, to, to look at. I've, I've spoken to principals, and this is what they're looking at right now. How do we how do we address this? How do we set up a school day where students are getting, because you know, and, and I think a lot of people who, who've taught in the inner city know this, mm -hmm. schools are, are, are sanctuaries for some of our students. You know, these are places where they can come and learn in peace or where they can have an opportunity to actually 
um, focus on their education. They may have distractions at home or they may not even have a home and a lot of, you know, a lot of our students are homeless. So what do we do to give them that space back, but at the same time make that, that space as safe as possible uh, during a global pandemic? Um, just as an educator perspective, and there are a lot of educators in the room, um, I know that um, during these recent months through distance learning, you know, we prepare the summer ahead and we tell ourselves we understand what we're going to deliver, how we're going to deliver it um, throughout the year. And um, just being slightly thrown off track a little bit, we're going through cycles of emotion. Um, I am calmed by the idea by Microsoft, I'm hearing maybe the concerns of teachers that if this is to be long term, because if you think about it, 21st century skills tech integration um, has been pushed with urgency, but at the same time, um, it's up to the rate of the teacher incorporating it into the classroom and now we're forced into it. So I appreciate the mention, um, Mr. Powell and Mr. Porter, of course, talking about equity amongst educators and to pass those opportunities down to the students um, is going to be a challenge if there's discrepancies between skills and knowledge. But um, I think the information is out there and to not, um, you know, we're going to be overwhelmed going into a situation, an environment where it's going to be physical and virtual, or it's going to transition back to virtual completely. Um, and hopefully with STEM professionals working on a potential vaccine or solution uh, to our little friendly virus, uh, we can maybe all together head back into the classroom um, one of these days and then kind of transition back to what's normal. Um, but that term normal, um, I hope that doesn't mean going back into the classroom where we can forget about technology and its, and its lack of access um, for certain communities at the end of the day. Because um, I can confirm that in a lot of classrooms that I've seen, technology has anywhere between 90 to 100% presence in those classrooms. So at least teachers who have begun um, they already have a starting point and it'll be interesting to see where technology goes and to see how close we get to quality education um, for students um, that are underserved in certain communities. Yeah. Hey, hey Veronica, can I just add one point? Just listening to Christy and, and kind of Dylan, what, what comes to my mind, if it's okay, is what, what I found really interesting is um, two thirds of the students today will work in jobs that don't yet exist. Um, and, and what's really interesting about that fact from the World Economic Forum is the skills that they are developing today, which interesting enough have been accelerated to the extent of how technology is being injected into their lives, both on the student and the educator side, will be critical skills for those jobs in the future. And, and so it's really interesting in terms of kind of the situation we've all been thrust into, but it also can be really interesting in terms of how it can turn into an advantage for us in terms of what the future would look like for jobs and for students in general. Yeah, yeah. just even to piggyback real quick on what Ali just said, because I, I think it's also, we have teachers out there who are veteran teachers who have had trepidation about using technology for years. And right. this, has been, this has been thrust upon them. And so I think that, and just this for Christy as well, she mentioned that I think this is a really a great opportunity for those teachers who may have had trepidation or, or just the overall fear of using technology or incorporating it into their lessons, uh, this is going to be a way to kind of push that forward and have some of those teachers lose that, 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 that fear and actually get their, get, get their hands dirty a little bit and, and use technology a little bit more in their instruction. So that's, that's a definite uh, positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys are bringing up so many different topics that um, I think we could s spend another hour on each of them, you know, in regards to sufficient training and professional development that we know is short um, on a regular um, non-COVID situation when we're trying to learn how to teach not just content effectively, but also on, on what platform. Um, I've, I've got a bunch of questions that I want to ask, but I'll stick to our, our script. But if you guys have questions, I wanna let you guys know that the last 15 minutes belong to the audience. So um, please do drop your, your questions into the chat box for us so that um, any th any think um, thinking that you might have for uh, Dylan, Christy, and Ali, they can uh, ruminate on out loud. 
Um, in the meantime, I want to continue with the line of thinking that you guys were going in. So if two thirds of the jobs of the future will not ex do not exist today, we know, um, and if we, we saw some of those disparities between our black and brown um, students and populations in South Los Angeles compared to the rest of the city, um, what does it mean um, to make certain that our, our black and uh, brown students are the ones that are being fully prepared for those jobs, those high growth jobs of the future? And I, you know, Ali, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'd love to hear what Microsoft's commitment is um, uh, to this, uh, to, to, to advancing, you know, I'll, I'll save it more directly, to advancing our black students' success in their career trajectories. Yeah, I, I look, I'm passionate about this one because I, I think I've been blessed for the opportunity that I've had. And I think if you have that opportunity, you have to create more opportunity for others. And if we talk about the two thirds, I just want to give one more fact that it's actually on my desktop that I keep in the right hand corner. And this one just drives me every day to the things that I want to be a part of. And I'll get into the programs, Veronica. But look, the, the data is clear. And, and studies actually show that less than 10% of the students who take an, an AP computer science exam are Hispanic. Um, less than 4% are black. That, that's a challenge for me. Um, what gives me promise and shows me where I wanna work in the middle is black and Hispanic students who take the AP computer science are seven times more likely, seven times more likely to major in it in college. Like now you kind of move into the middle and you start to ask questions to your question. What are we specifically doing to drive up some of those rates so we can increase some of those outcomes? Because that formula is clear that there's a way for us to drive more in both directions. I, I think the first thing specifically that Microsoft is doing in terms of two programs is we do have a program um, called TILS. Um, this actually brings Microsoft employees or technology employees into classrooms for schools. Um, and I think TILS is really special now in a COVID world because when you have the situations where you had distance, you had travel, you had logistics, the software, we've seen an acceleration of the TILS program because to an extent, we don't have to leave our homes. Or there's no commute that's associated with it. So our means to leverage and be involved in the classroom and support teachers across that curriculum, we're seeing that bar go down, which means we're actually seeing usage and participation go up. I think on the other side of that, there's cash grants and technology and resources that we support through one art nonprofit called code.org, um, through Microsoft Philanthropies, that really helps enable get access to content. And having access to that content is key. And I know it goes back to the digital divide, and I wanna just address kind of how a person can approach solving for that. But supporting an institutions like that creates access to content that's also curated not only for the student, but also for the teacher. Because I think there's two sides to this equation um, that sometimes when you solve for one, you create discrepancies for the other. And so you kind of have to look at it from a two-prong perspective. I think the last one I just want to touch on, which is a really important program that I just want to root everybody in some facts. Look, there's 116 Microsoft stores. There's 506 Apple stores. There's 100 plus meetups um, on tech within a 50 mile radius of Los Angeles. The Microsoft stores put on a program called YouthSpark. YouthSpark runs summer camps. This is something that isn't necessarily available now within the COVID world. But again, as the dial starts to turn, these become excellent solutions that can actually enable kids and educators to gain access to new skills and new opportunities within STEM. And the last one I wanna leave you with is the Microsoft Imagine Academy. That one's kind of special because that essentially takes two words and challenges the thinking to drive curiosity. And I, and I think that's at the root of STEM. It challenges around using the words why and how. And through that Imagine Academy, students and educators can get more involved around questioning how things work. And then behind that question, gaining an understanding of how they work. And then you can actually go on tutorials to build skills, to develop solutions and how that work. And so I think if you can create these platforms, for folks to have access to that can start to 
bridge interest in the technology for the educator as well as for the student, I think we can start to close that gap and have an impact, Veronica. Hey, real quick, Ali, just, this is Dylan real quick. So just, just, uh, and I know, I don't know, I don't want to put Christy on the spot, but Christy's been doing a lot of work with a student tech team at LA Promise Charter Middle School. And it kind of goes into that idea of, of promoting different STEM uh, aspects. Christy, do you want to talk about that real quick? Just some of the stuff that you were doing before COVID hit. Um, can you enable the chat? Can the chat be enabled so that we can ask the questions we want to ask? Thank you. Okay. Got you. Um, Go ahead, Chris. Sorry, Christy. Oh, ahead. well, thank you, Porter, because I only have a coding club because of school to home in the first place. Um, but just like Mr. Powell said, um, it's important to offer the opportunities for students to not just engage in virtual classroom for science class, but it's also important, and I was able to still continue with Girls Build online um, this last year, a year-long program, and also work with students um, for the science and engineering fair. But if you can imagine, um, students who use physical materials um, for their investigations, we kind of um, had little setbacks. But yes, if Microsoft can make a promise that they're going to keep these programs and help out students as an educator, I can 100% promise that I will still be pushing these STEM professions. Um, but that is why it's going to be important to not settle for the technology we have right now, but to continue to push it um, because it won't replace that awesome chemistry um, experiment having to do with liquids and such. Um, with maybe something digital if students haven't had that initial experience. So um, is that what you mean, Dylan? <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wanted to just talk about, I know you have the coding club and the idea mm -hmm. of working with, you know, doing these things outside the box, getting kids to work. You know, mm -hmm. we have a, at least at um, LA Promise, we've been lucky enough, we have a great uh, uh, tech lead over there at LA mm -hmm. Promise with, with Jaime Chang, and he's done a lot of work yeah. with that student tech, with the student tech team as well, in terms of having students actually work learn how to fix devices, learn how to mm -hmm. replace screens, replace keyboards, and giving them kind of those that understand that, yeah, you can do this. Like you can take a computer apart mm -hmm. and put it back together again. And um, I just think those kind of, those, like you talk about those physical experiences really do mm -hmm. make a difference for students' confidence in overall tech. Yeah, and, and, and I think there's one myth that's out there that I just, I want to square into and maybe it'll become a controversial topic. But if you think about STEM, it's not just about math. And, and more often than not, um, that there's this perception, I'd love for you guys to correct me if I'm wrong here, but th this notion around is technology just about math? Um, and, and it's not. Um, if you look at where artificial intelligence is going, it, rec it gets computers to recognize patterns. And that patterns could be very diverse thoughts, patterns around fashion, patterns around music, patterns around decision making in certain situations. Those things aren't fundamentally just rooted in math. And so when you think about STEM and the application of STEM, um, Christy, to your point, having the chance to tinker and toy with it in the physical world in the same way you would in the digital world creates that application for exploration in a variety of different ways. And I think that's really key and critical. Sorry, Veronica, I cut you off, but I wanted to make that point. No, I just, I just hear you saying that not only do we have to take care of the eight to three, we got to take care of the 3 to 8 p.m. and the weekends for enrichment kids. We've been pushing that, all, you know, all of us educators, all of us nonprofits have been pushing that for so long and we have so many partners in crime that have been doing this. And, um, uh, you know, I think that in the first version of distance learning, we took care of core. Uh, round two, come this next school year, we're gonna have to make certain that all those enrichment opportunities are available. Even this summer, you know, we talk about summer slide every year um definitely need to talk about that i know it's a slippery slope with how much you know, as a parent i'm always concerned about how much screen time my kids were getting you know that was pre-covid now i don't know how much screen time they're supposed to be getting when everything's online um, um we'll save that for a little bit later um how are we doing let me do a quick time check and it is time for q a i have some more questions i want to ask but i want to honor honor the fact that we said the audience would be able to engage me up Great. Thank you, everyone. This has been a really stimulating conversation. Um, I have a question um, from Timothy Watkins. How are students supposed to continue learning if there is no high-speed access beyond smartphones? 
Yeah, let me, I wanted to chime in on that. I saw that, I saw that pop up real quick. And, uh, you know, from our, from our point of view, we, there's a couple of, two different resources I can give you right now to, to kind of reach out to. These are two different non-for-profits that do, that help families get connected who uh, may struggle with getting connections. So the one, the first one is Human IT. Um, you can feel free to follow those links in the chat box and, and, and kind of go through their process. But both of these, Human IT, everyoneon.org, help families get uh, low cost internet offers. And then they also help them work through the red tape of it as a non-for-profit. They go and they advocate, they make sure that they have the right documentation. And they also give pushback to, to some of these corporations, some of these broadband corporations who, you know, present, oh, we're doing low cost internet, but when you call, it's, it's this, oh, but you, you already have this and you got to pay the full price because of this, this, and this. And they're not offering those, those things. I think it actually happened in Watts where you had that, you know, a study that was done where they actually, you know, they called these, these companies during the pandemic trying to get the low cost offers and the, the, the reps wouldn't give them the low cost offers. And so these two different non for profits kind of help with that. So this is a resource you can give the parents and families to help them navigate uh, affordable broadband. Awesome. Thank you, Dylan. And those are great resources. So yes, please check them out. Um, next question. Um, from an educator's perspective, has there been any consideration of completely reconsidering or revamping the education model or class schedule slash curriculum to maximize available technologies? It seems that there's a focus on adapting technologies to fit the traditional educational model rather than the other way around. Um, so we'll just leave it there. Let's see, um, if I can chime in and if anyone else wants to add, um, currently, um, being a part of multiple fellowships, uh, one with a statewide cohort and a national cohort, there's some patterns that I'm observing. Absolutely, we're trying to adapt technology into a virtual classroom, um, but right now, educators are being asked to troubleshoot and create a reality where if virtual and physical were to run parallel to one another, how is what you're doing already, how can it be converted um, into a quality experience virtually? Um, because I don't think you can lose out, especially if you have students already who are absent and need to recover from work, um, you're already doing that partial work to get them caught up, whether it's through a different media. And so um, what we can do is, is to consider both platforms. Now, that sounds like a lot of work. And no doubt it will be, but that's because educators now, um, we're being called upon to utilize skills such as collaboration um, to work together as a team. And I think that will be um, the key, of course, but um, that, that is from my point of view and what I've experienced right now when I'm also on these learning management systems as both a teacher and a student working with a very age diverse, culturally diverse um, cohort. And that's um, taking place right now too. So um, I thank those educators, my colleagues for helping me out through my troubles. Thanks, Christy. That's great, thank you. I might just also point to a reference, reference. I was trying to find a website, um, but couldn't pull it up because I'm not so good at multitasking here, but um, maybe one of my friends can help. I know that there have been um, some conversations about the ability of lab sciences, and Christy's, you've alluded to this, to providing lab sciences online, and you've heard this, whether you're talking about it at, at the K-12 to or the post-secondary level. Um, so I just want to make certain that we point out one resource that we were happy to be a part of, um, the lab exchange with the Amgen Biotech Experience that pushed out a ton of labs online that are kind of soups to nuts online experiences for teachers and their students um so so wanted to make certain we make that one available to you guys as you talk about um realizing that education um might have to exist on a virtual basis um for a good portion of our country um, so not just workarounds as i saw one of the terms used in the chat box um what's next mia uh, a question for uh, Ellie, Microsoft. Um, is Microsoft planning to um, uh, partner with organizations to do more hackathons? Uh, I, I think the answer to that absolutely is, is yes. Um, I think there's two avenues for that to take place. Um, the organization that Carla is a part of 
actually runs um, camps that kind of go through coding as well as hackathon events. I think that's the first place to start. There's also um, on the Microsoft website, and I'll get the website and post it into the chat window, there's access to online hackathons and hackathons that we run through meetups. So I think those two would be, really those three options would be the best options in terms of how to gain access to more hackathons and how we would partner with other organizations to deliver them. Awesome. Um, one more question for you, Ali, while I have your attention. Um, another one is, can you expand a little bit on what you called the homework gap? Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, when, when I kind of look at the opportunity for us to solve one of the scenarios with the digital divide, it, it's the disparity in online access. Um, and it's really the, the gap between school age children who have access to high speed internet at home and those who don't. Um, the Pew Research, and I'll put the link um, in the chat window for those to have a look at, uh, did a very interesting study as we think about kind of certain age throughout the learning journey. There's a very interesting one when you look at kind of now with COVID having to deliver an actual educational experience, a learning experience remote from K through four. And, and how do you do that? Um, and so that talks about that and that the definition of that, as I talked about, was the gap between school age children who have access to high speed internet at home and those who don't. Awesome. And then um, a question, I think, to all of you. Um, how do you believe that education in Southern California and throughout California or the U.S. can play a role in our economic recovery? A hard one. A hard question. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I, just, I was just in a conversation the other day, and we're um, being very studious about what reopening means for us um, and I think I made mention of it that the guidelines that we're receiving is that you do you open your classrooms but you do so in a way that can be safer um, and try to put into place um, all the health necessities all the, all, all the precautions to, to, to um, help stop the spread of COVID right so social distancing cleansing um, um, what does lunchtime look like? All that good stuff. The second one is keeping distance learning going. And then the third might be a hybrid. And so there's tons of challenges of doing that um, because what it essentially represents is that we're in this conundrum right now that pivots the necessity to educate children, the necessity to support um, strong public health efforts, and the necessity to make certain that the economy opens up. And we know that when students are at home, that it's tough for the parents um, to be engaged in that economy. And so I think that is what we're trying to balance as educators. And we're all being very mindful about how we enter into this world going in um, to the next school year. Um, but it's gonna be very difficult um, for us to achieve um, you know, education 100%, public health 100%, and economic recovery 100%, um, given our current trends. Uh, and, and I just, on that note, I just wanna salute all of you that have become um, superstar teaching assistants as parents at home. Um, so, you know, I think all of our educator, educators this year appreciate their parents even more because we know that you guys had to pull double time um, by helping your students stay on track. And I, I, you know, I've got three kiddos in elementary, middle, and high school and understand the level of frustration that we sometimes encountered and also having to become tech savvy and not knowing the login and password. Um, so I appreciate you guys staying strong with us. Any, of my, any, any other of my friends on that, that topic? Well, I mean, with the support that I think school districts need right now uh, from a, the corporate level, whether that is like what we were talking about in the chat with the access to affordable broadband, whether that's, you know, opportunities for, school, for schools and districts to partner with companies and corporations that are offering, you know, Chromebooks or Surface devices or iPads. You know, there's opportunities there for districts to partner with corporations. I think that could be a way of uh, helping maybe jumpstart. I don't know if it's going to jumpstart the economy or not, but it's going to help hopefully get our students where they need to go. Um, 
I just think that, that we want to make sure we're mindful as we go through this process that even though some of our schools are in distress, we make sure that we are, uh, we're finding companies that are actually looking to really truly benefit our students and not just profit off of them. Great. Thank you both. Um, next question. Um, this is from another one of our young professional council members. Uh, how do we all start demanding that more LA companies get involved with improving student experiences and outcomes and supporting our teachers, both STEM or non-STEM companies? Um, as an educator and um, knowing that professional opportunities have basically fueled my career for the last nine years, um, the opportunities are out there, but they may be limited or competitive. So what do teachers really need? Um, do they need support with correct um, curriculum because they're gonna transfer it um, into a classroom, a virtual classroom with students? Um, so the opportunities are out there and maybe what we can do is um, kind of think about, for example, where the professional development is, how they're marketing it, and um, where they want to target. Um, primary school teachers are going to respond differently to maybe certain experiences or ones that would, they would want from professional development, as are middle school teachers and high school teachers. And um, if those teachers don't get the professional development and they may not experience something um, new and necessary, especially in our times, can they effectively um, get their students into a learning environment to have, um, to have them come out of a very public and um, qualified education so then they're ready um, for work? I think that's going to be, um, I mean, that's an interesting question overall. So how can we demand more LA, count, um, LA companies to get involved? I think Teachers such as Mr. Porter right here, Dylan, um, he is a consultant for School to Home. So if companies can open up more of those positions, I think that's going to create more of a pathway and trickle in resources and knowledge um, from organizations, uh, Microsoft, for example, um, into the school sites um, throughout the districts. I'm waiting to see if anyone else goes off on mute just to chime in. I think there's just going to be a greater reliance on what we have, I think, uh, not fully. Um, uh, you want to put yourself on mute, Veronica. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was waiting to see if anyone else unmuted before I took a chance, and then I thought I unmuted. But I would, I would just summarize and saying there's just going to be a greater reliance. Um, we've always talked about the need for private, public, and nonprofit. Um, partnerships, uh, it's going to be essential moving forward. It's going to be essential for all of us. The, the private companies are going to need us to, to work with them and their employees when it talks about schedules because, you know, their kids are potentially at home two days out of the week because we have to do some social distancing and we can't keep all kids on campus. Um, we're going to need more leadership, both from our corporations in terms of their, you know, and I appreciate Microsoft coming on and learning from Christy and learning from Dylan about how their applications can work better and what some un, um, unfilled gaps still are. We're gonna need leadership in the public sector at both at the school district level, the city partnerships. Um, um, we're talking about the public utilities commissions and what is low, who, who has access to low cost internet beyond just a three month trial. Um, appreciate that coming out of Watts um, because we have to make certain it's sustainable. So we're really going to have to push and work collaboratively together um, to, to embrace and hold each other all accountable and, and create some collective strategies here. And I think that puts us at time. Hey, real, real, sorry, I know, we're, I know we're over, Veronica, but real quick, there's a question in the chat that I think, you know, we might want to consider talking about real quick. It says, you know, how are the needs of ELLs being addressed through this time at stay at home and for the future? I just think that's such a crucial question. That goes even beyond just ELL students, even into students who have IEPs. How does, what does that look like? You know, so I mean, I think that's a big question. We might, I just want to at least take a small stab at it. Um, Liliana, I don't know what, what people are going to do on this. I don't know how you address the needs of students who have, who are ELL, who need that direct support um, in a digital format. And so, I, as we, 
Go, go ahead. Oh, that's actually Ali. Yeah, go ahead, Ali. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I know, I, I know I you can talk about that question, Dylan, Dylan, I was actually trying to type and listen as because I was responding to it, but I, I, I did want to kind of call it out too. I think it, when I talked about accessibility with it, at least the tooling from a Microsoft perspective, when, when you think about kind of creating an opportunity not only just for neurodiversity when it comes to just communicating and learning in that space. You also can think about tooling, about subtitling this conversation, then taking those subtitles and translating them into a variety of different languages. Um, and having the means to do that in real time, um, there's a capability for that. There's a means to do that and capture kind of post time in terms of after the class is actually being over. Um, and there's also a way to actually take that and weave that into the discussion. Um, I communicate a lot with folks in other countries and leveraging our technology to kind of balance to a certain extent what percentage of the conversation needs to be in their native language versus what percentage of the conversation needs to be into the new language that they want to grow skill in, Dylan. You can fine tune that with technology and that's native within the tools that exist within Microsoft today. So I think it's about creating some awareness for I think our teachers as well as the students in terms of how to enable those capabilities because they sit right within the Microsoft technologies I can speak to today that they can take advantage of. And I think that's a first step to a variety of different dials that exist within the technologies to help. That's awesome, thanks. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, a good way to wrap it up with a, um, us honing in um, on the populations that uh, we are committed to serving, which is our black, brown students, which are so often our English learners and our special ed students. Um, that need um, additional supports um, and technologies above and beyond uh, the usual ones for mainstream um, um, considerations. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, you guys, I've got at least 10 other questions that have um, risen to the top of my head that we have run out of time for. Um, such a great conversation. You guys can see how relevant it is to the times. Uh, you know that everything that we have talked about today could could change by the time schools open in August. So it's very, very fluid environment that we're all working in. Just wanna um, thank our panelists once again, Dylan, Ali, Christy, thank you guys um, for putting yourselves out there um, and getting our brain stimulated. I promised you guys a good Wednesday night conversation. Um, and last of, um, but not least, thank you all for participating. Um, you can always find out more by reaching out to us. We're happy to uh, follow up with any of you guys looking for more information and resources. We've moved all of our materials to a digital platform. And if you're looking to support um, a nonprofit working on both distance learning and keeping our kids active throughout the summer, please consider donating to the LA Promise Fund. Um, you can see the information on the website. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.